So where we need to go next is that right now the problem that we have is if we look at the question class, its constructor takes that question and calls the set text method. Um, and the set text method is designed just to like be the mutator method for that text, the question text instance variable. And understandably, it just simply reassigns uh, or assigns the parameter to that text. This would be problematic for our fill in the blank question um, because like the answer is there. We don't want to store that as part of the question prompt. That would get, basically give away the answer. So we want to change the behavior of set text. And we do that by overriding that method. That's one of the things that subclasses can do. They can override um, a method of their superclass. So we're going to go through the syntax of how we do that today. Um, so I'm going to get rid of this example here. We'll, well, I guess we can, we can leverage the comment here. All right, so we're going to implement, we're going to override the set text method. So this method, oops, this method overrides the set text method in the question class. Specifically, it sets the question text and answer. We want to set both of them because the answer is embedded in the question text. So we need to extract it and set both the question text and the answer. And this can take one parameter called question text, which is the text of the question, including the answer. So let's clean up the method here, public void set text. Cool. I'll put our own code in here. One mistake that I make all the time and that you may make um, and is really frustrating when you do uh, is I intend to override a method, but I accidentally misspell something like I, I just misspell the method name. Um, or I have the wrong type of parameter because I wasn't really thinking it through. Because remember, when we override a method, the signatures have to match exactly. The method must be called set text, and it must take exactly one parameter, and that parameter must be of type string. Um, and so if I don't notice this, the code's going to compile, but when I run it, it's not going to work as I expect, and I'm going to be really confused as to why my overridden method isn't being called. So this is such a common issue that there's a special Java annotation to help us with this. And it's, uh, we'll put it right before the method header. And we only do this when we're typing code in like BlueJ. We don't do this when we're like writing out code for an exam or a quiz or anything. We put at override in front of it. We'll put a comment block here explaining what that is. We will use the at override. It's called an annotation. That's what we call these at things in Java. When overriding a method to help the compiler verify that you are in fact overriding and not overloading by mistake. Okay. So for example, like here, I misspelled the method name and so I actually now get a compiler error where I wouldn't have gotten one before. And it says, wait a minute, this method does not override a method from a super type, right? There is no set text with two X's method in your super class. So at least I catch this error at compile time before I'm really confused. Even if I spell the method name right, but I change the type of the parameter, like to int, for example, I still get a, a, a compiler error. Okay, because now I accidentally overloaded the method instead of overwrote it. And so the Java compiler will now tell me, wait a minute, this isn't okay. You're not overriding like you said you were. So please, please save yourself a headache. Use at override whenever you're writing code. Um, and it, your life will be a lot better. So, all right. So what, what are we going to do in here? Um, 
often when we override a method, there's some extra behavior we want. Um, it's not like we totally don't like what the superclass does. Like it's still probably useful. We may even call it, um, but we want to do some extra code before or after um, calling that superclass. And in this case, we want to do some extra code before because we have the answer embedded in our question text um, and we want to extract it. We're going to do this very efficiently using the scanner class. So we are probably most familiar using the scanner class to prompt the user for input. We do that a lot. We've also used the scanner class to read from a file. We did that in the gerrymandering lab. Today, we're going to see that we can actually make a new scanner object to parse another string, which is exactly what, what we want here. We'll provide the question text as the um, input to the scanner class. And then we'll change our delimiter, which by default would be spaces, but we don't want to really read every word here. We'll change our delimiter to an underscore. And that way, when we say next, we're going to get all the characters up to that first underscore. And when we invoke next again, we're going to get all the characters between the underscores. And when we invoke next a third time, we'll get all the characters after the second underscore. So let's see what that looks like. So we'll make a new scanner. I'm going to call it parser. And I'll say new scanner. And instead of saying system.in or specifying a reference to a file, we'll say question text. We want to scan the string question text. In addition, much like we did in the gerrymandering lab, we're going to call the use delimiter method. And we'll specify that instead of spaces, and tabs and new lines and stuff like that, our delimiter is going to be an underscore. So when we say string question equals parser.next, what will actually be returned from parser.next in our example here is the inventor of Java is and a space. Everything up to the dot. And then when we say string.answer equals parser.next, what, what is returned is just the answer part, which is perfect. And then we just want to call parser.next one more time and add that into the question. But we have a little other stuff to do with the question too, because we're replacing where the answer was with a blank. So I'm just going to put some underscores there as the blank. And then we'll say parser.next to get everything else, which in this case is just a period, but that's okay. Well, I guess we have all the blanks. Like that. At this point, what we tend to do, which is quite understandable, is we're like, this is fantastic. We figured out what the question is. We figured out what the answer is. We just need to update these instance variables accordingly. So we say this.text equals question, and this.answer equals answer, just like we would normally do. However, this does not compile, OK? Um, Text and answer both have private visibility. We can't change them in a subclass. And again, I'm just going to mention this one more time. The solution is not to go up to the top of this file and declare text and answer as instance variables and fill in question. That will make it compile, and it will totally not work. Okay. So this definitely warrants one more question about these instance variables things, and we're going to say, the inherited instance variables are private. They cannot be directly accessed. It's not split or infinity. 
So we must use the mutator and accessor methods. So I'm going to comment this out. Leave it here as reference. Like this won't work. Just keep it in mind. So we want to we want to call the the mutator method instead. Okay. So we need to find what is the mutator method in the parent class that we can use to set the question. And if we scroll through this, sure enough, there is a set text method. But wait a minute. We're in the set text method. That's the very method we're overriding. So we need a way of actually calling the superclasses. Because if we just say this dot set text and pass in the question, we've overridden set text. So when this line of code executes, it's going to call this method. And we're going to run this code again. And we're going to call set text again. And it's going to call this method. And we're going to run this code again. And that's going to go on forever. Okay. So that doesn't work. The way we solve this is we explicitly say, no, 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 don't call this class's set text method. That's the override. Call the super classes. And that's the second way we use the super keyword. So we will use the super reserved word to call the set text method as defined in the super class. In this case, that's question. That's how we explicitly call into a superclasses method from an overridden subclasses method. And this is fairly common. Often it's like, hey, let's do something special, and then we'll call the superclass. Or the vice versa, we might say, hey, let's call the superclass, and then we'll do something special. They both work. All right, so this takes care of setting the question. We still have to deal with the answer. And if we look in the super class, there is a set answer mutator method. That's perfect. So we're going to call that as well. However, here we're going to say this dot set answer, not super dot set answer. In this particular case, if you said super dot set answer, it would compile and it would work, but it's not considered best practice. And, and here's why. So we should use the this reserved word to call the set answer method. The reason why is like, it's gonna work, first of all. So why, why does it work? Well, if the subclass doesn't, doesn't override the set answer method. The super classes method will be called. That's inheritance. That's great. That's the behavior we want. Um, we have not overrode set answer. We have inherited set answer from the super class. So we'll just call that super classes implementation. Okay. That doesn't really address though, like why shouldn't we say super dot set answer? Wouldn't that work as well? We don't want to use the super reserved word in this case because if we later override set answer, oops, the overridden method would not be called. Okay. So imagine we come back to this code weeks from now. And we realize, oh, we actually do need to override set answer. And we do, but we totally forgot that we had written super dot set answer in this other method. That wouldn't call the new overridden method and our code would probably not work the way we want. Um, so best practices call this dot set answer. And if it's overridden, it'll call the overridden version. And if it's not, it calls the inherited version. And it's always gonna work as expected. Here's a good rule of thumb. In general, the only time we say super dot and a method name is when we're in the middle of overriding that very method, right? So since we're overriding set text, inside of set text, we'll say super dot set text to get to the super class. But that's the only time we really use super dot um, is when we're in the overridden method and we're calling to the super class one.
In all other cases, we'll just keep using this like we always have. Cool, this compiles now. Now we have something useful. Let's, um, let's look at question demo, which is already written for us, at least the beginning, or it's mostly written for us. Um, it's just got a static main method, creates a scanner. Um, right now, question is set to null. Let's change that. So I'm gonna remove that comment and have it say question Q equals new fill in question. Um, it prints the question, which we'll call the two string method, prompts for an answer, checks if we get it right. All right, and that all now compiles fine. I think that sometimes it's hard to really wrap your head around this inheritance thing until you step through the code and actually sees what code is called when. So let's actually do that together. I'm gonna set a breakpoint here where we're about to make a new fill in question. And then I'm going to run this main method. I'll rearrange my window slightly so you can see everything. So we're about to make a new fill in question. Okay. So I'm going to hit step into so we can see that constructor. And when I hit step into, we're inside the constructor for fill in question, as expected. That's pretty good. Um, and the line of code we're about to execute is the first way we saw yesterday that we used the super reserved word, where we want to call an explicit constructor of the super class. So we're about to call the super classes constructor. And if I hit step into, sure enough, now we're in the question class and we're in its constructor. And now we're about to call the set text method and pass along the question text. Okay. Here's the thing. I can literally see the set text method. It's right here. It's just a few lines down. But when I hit step into, I'm in a totally different class. I'm in the fill in question class. So even though we called set text in the question class, the Java runtime somehow figured out that it was overridden and it put us in the overridden version in the fill in question class. As it should, that's the behavior we want. Um, this is really important. What, what is going on here is something we call dynamic method invocation. And this happens at runtime, um, and only at runtime, uh, with Java. And so the way that Java works when it's about to call a method is it doesn't really, it doesn't care what the type of the variable is. So the type of this in this case would be of type question. Instead, it says, hey, variable, I know you reference an object somewhere in the computer's memory. Okay, think back to our like physical memory model with like the turtles or the conceptual model with the sheets of paper. So it follows that reference to the actual object stored in the computer's memory. They get that sheet of paper that has the class name written across the top. And it asks the object, hey, what, what type are you? What class are you really from? Are you just a question or are you something else? And in this case, that object says, no, I'm actually a fill-in question. And so the Java runtime says, hey, fill-in question class, did you override set text? And it responds, yep, I did. And it's like, okay, we'll call your version of set text. And that's what it does here. So that's the dynamic method invocation. Which version of the method is called is based on the type of the object, not on the type of the variable or which file we're in. All that matters is the actual type of the object stored in the computer's memory. And this is hugely powerful. Much like the substitution principle we focused on yesterday, dynamic method invocation is, is one of those fundamental pieces that makes all of this inheritance stuff work. So let's keep stepping through this. Now that we're in the overridden version, we can create our scanner, we can use the delimiter, we can grab the first part of the question, that looks pretty good. We can grab the answer, that looks pretty good. We can grab the second part of the question and put in the blank, that looks great. And then here we're about to call the super classes version of set text. And if I step into that, sure enough, now we're in the question class. Now we're gonna update our instance variable um, as we want, which is great. 
And then here's our call to set answer. Even though we say this dot set answer and there is no set answer in the fill in question class, it is inherited. So when we step into it, we're in the questions classes version of set answer. We update that, we're good to go. Everything is fine. Um, we can also see some other examples here. So actually, I don't know if we need the rest of this right now. But when we do print an object, it implicitly calls the two string method. So if I hit step into, sure enough, I'm in the two string method of the question class. And I'll print it out on our screen. Too many windows. And it can prompt us for like the answer. And we can say it's James Gosling. And it will say, true, we got it correct, yay. And our program is done. So stepping through this can be a really helpful tool to help you understand the interactions between the subclasses and the superclasses.